Lesson three, automation and design efficiency. Design automation is the purposeful organization and creation of electronic files in the most efficient way possible for current design and future editing needs. Designers who utilize design automation techniques prepare files quickly that can be edited easily in the future. For example, when working with clients, edits are often needed. Changing all instances of Pantone Green C to another shade of green like Pantone 336C could be a long and time-consuming process if done manually. Each instance would need to be changed one by one individually. However, if all instances of Pantone Green have been linked to a Pantone Green color swatch via the swatches panel, the adjustment can be done in seconds by updating the saved color swatch to the new color. Time is money. Whether you plan to work full-time at a design agency or become a freelance graphic designer, your time is worth something and it should be spent wisely. Utilizing design automation techniques makes your electronic design time efficient and allows the bulk of your time to be spent on important designerly things like client relations, research, concepts, layouts, and more. You're getting paid for your creativity not to spend hours spell-checking, replacing fonts, and updating color swatches manually. Good designers can process these more trivial things quickly and efficiently so that most of their time is spent on actually designing. Anything that makes the digital design process easier, either for current design needs or for future editing, can be considered a form of design automation. For the purposes of this class, we'll put different forms of design automation into two categories, the basics and beyond the basics. Basic design automation includes things you should already be doing as part of your natural everyday InDesign workflow, like saving color swatches, using object, paragraph, and character styles, creating parent pages, checking spelling in the document, and properly pre-flighting and packaging your work. We'll review these processes now for reference. If you need a more thorough review, please reference the lessons from your previous InDesign course. In this demo video, I would like to review some of the steps needed to perform basic automation techniques in InDesign. Again, these should be part of your natural InDesign workflow. So these are just a review to make sure that you have all the steps down. Let's get started by talking about color swatches. If you save all of the colors that you use to your swatches panel, it gives you the ability to edit those color swatches and to make sure that those changes flow throughout the entire document. You can open the swatches panel by going to the window menu, color, and then choosing swatches. My swatches panel shows that I am using two specific colors for this project. I am using an InDesign pink color and an InDesign blue color. You can also see some additional information about those colors on the swatches panel. They are a process build of red, green, and blue. They're in RGB color mode. The reason that they're in RGB color mode is that I am preparing this as a digital textbook that will be embedded into a Canvas course. So I want all the settings for my project to be for the web. If I was changing this and going to make it a print project, I could double click the little square swatch icon on the far left hand side of the color swatch to open the swatch options dialog. And from here, you can change the color type from process to spot if applicable. And you'll also be able to change the color mode from RGB to anything else that you would want, including CMYK if you were preparing for printing. So saving and reusing your color swatches is one form of automation, but a huge benefit to using color swatches is the ability to edit your color and have that color change throughout your entire document. This project is a multi-page multi book that has that blue and pink color distributed throughout the entire project. If I decide to change the pink to be a different shade of pink or even a different color entirely, and I have not saved my color via the swatches panel, I will have to go and find the color and manually change it each and every time. However, because I made sure that every time I use this pink color, I have synced it to the swatches panel with nothing selected if I double click the swatch icon. 
I can change the color of the swatch to a different color. Maybe we want the background to be green now instead of pink. And as soon as I select OK, everywhere that I have used pink in my entire document will change or update to be the green color. It also gives me an opportunity to click through my design. And if I find any location of pink still in the project, I could highlight it and resync it to the correct color swatch so that the next time I change the color from green to maybe purple, all of the changes will flow and I won't have to double check it. We can repeat that for the blue color swatch. So since we changed the background to be green, maybe we want the highlight color or the accent color not to be dark blue. Maybe we want this to be a pinky red color. So if I change the color, I can select OK, and then I can go through my document and I can see everywhere that I have used blue has now automatically updated to be this ready pink color. Don't forget to rename your swatches. So if I am going to leave this as a green color, I would change this to InDesign green. And if I was going to leave this as uh, a red or pinky red color, I would change this to InDesign red. However, I'm going to hit undo, which is command or control Z on your keyboard several times until I get back to my InDesign pink and my InDesign blue color because they are the colors that I would like to use. The next option I would like to review are styles. There are five types of styles in InDesign, object styles, paragraph and character styles, and table and cell styles. Styles are created, saved, and edited all in the same way. So I'm gonna focus on paragraph and character styles in this demo. If you understand how paragraph and character styles are created, saved, and edited, you'll be able to apply the same principles to object styles, table and cell styles. To get started, let's open the paragraph and character styles panels. You can open them via the window menu. Go to window, styles, and then open character styles and paragraph styles. Mine are already open on my workspace, so I'm going to unnest them and undock them so that they are hanging out on the side of my workspace. This document is set up with many paragraph styles and a few character styles. Every instance of text in this document is linked to a paragraph style. You should always apply broad changes first and then specific changes second. In this case, a broad change is a paragraph style and a specific change is a character style. If I place my text cursor anywhere in the document, it will tell me which paragraph style this text is linked to and it's linked to lesson title. I've also made a decision that every form of type in this document uh, uses the same typeface. So the learning objectives typeface is Monistrat, Montserrat. Um, the learning objective headline is Montserrat. The body copy is Montserrat. So as part of developing all of these paragraph styles, and you can see all the ones that exist in the document, I made sure that I decided what my primary style is going to be. And I decided that body copy should determine what the typeface is. So if I go into the body copy paragraph style, it is based on no paragraph style. However, when I go to any other style, I made sure that it's based on body copy. So if I change the body copy paragraph style, all of the other paragraph styles will also change. A benefit of saving styles, whether they're object styles or paragraph styles, is that if you edit any individual style, the instance of that particular style will change. So if I click on lesson title, which is just used on the first page here, I can edit that style. And as a reminder, when we edit styles, make sure nothing is selected so that you don't accidentally apply the style as you're trying to edit. You can then double click the style and it will open. And on the far left hand side, you can go through any of the settings that are available and you can change the settings. And then every instance of that style throughout the design will change. I've only used the style once, so it's only gonna make one change. But if I was to choose, let's say, body copy titles that are blue, there's a lot of them throughout the document. If I was to come in here 
and I was to change, let's change the color because that'll be obvious to see, and I was to change the character color of that to be a different color. Or if I was to, let's say, change the style from bold to be light italic, it would change throughout the design. So let's find an example of what this style looks like. What is pre-flighting and why do we do it is linked to the body copy titles blue style. If we deselect and then we edit that style and we find the option to change the title from bold to light italic, you can see as soon as I make that change, because I have the preview option selected, I can see that my headline changed. But not just that headline. Any instance of that headline throughout the entire document is now light and italic. Again, that's not something that I want, so I will have to undo it. So I'm going to do Command or Control Z to undo until my headlines are bold again. Let me show you a better application of this. Let's say that you decide that you no longer want Montserrat to be your typeface. You can edit the body copy typeface because I linked all of my typefaces to this. And by doing that, I can come in and change the basic character format and I can change the typeface. So if I change it to, let's find, let's use noteworthy because it's distinctly different. When I change it to noteworthy, you can clearly see that the headline is now different. But not only that, because all of my styles are linked to body copy and I've changed the body copy typeface, every typeface in the entire document has now been changed to noteworthy. And again, that's not something I want, so I'm going to choose Command or Control Z to undo. Parent pages are another really great way to automate your design processes and speed up how long it takes to edit a document in the future. If we look at this example, page one has a pink background, but every other page in the design has a thin gray bar at the top. It is created by using a gray rectangle, and that rectangle repeats identically from page to page. It is the same size, in the same location, and is exactly the same color. Because it repeats identically, it is a great candidate for a parent page. Open your pages panel. You can navigate to the parent pages by double clicking any one of the parent options at the top of the panel. If your pages panel is not open, you can open it by choosing window and pages on your menu bar. The bottom half of the panel shows our real or our actual pages, but if I double click the page to the right of a parent, I will navigate to that specific parent page and I can see that it has a gray bar that's editable, I could change the color or the size, on the parent page. Then I can also see, if I look closely, that page one has no parent page attached to it because it has no capital letter. And then pages two, three, four, five, and every other page in the document is linked to a parent. Meaning that if there is a gray bar on a parent, every page that is linked to a parent will also have a gray bar. It also speeds up our editing process because if we decide to change the color or add something to it, we can do it on the parent page. Maybe we want to make the panel pink instead of gray. You can select it on the parent page and change the color to pink. It's 15% tint of pink, but now if we go back to our pages, page two has a pink bar and page three and page four. It also allows us to say, maybe pink's not right. Maybe we wanna go back to the parent page and try the blue color. The blue, well, let me make sure that that talk. The blue color is a little bit more subtle. So now if we go to page two and three and four, that might be more appropriate. Or we could even go back and say, you know what? I really just wanted it to be gray, but it was nice to be able to test those options. And now when I go back to pages two and three and four, my parent page has updated that gray bar to be back to the original gray color. It is important to always run spell check on your project before you finalize, especially in a project like we're looking at on screen right now. This is a text heavy layout that has lots of words 
and so the potential to spell something wrong is high. Every time you're done a project, I want you to get into the habit of choosing edit, spelling, and check spelling. From the check spelling dialog, you have several options. The first thing you should do is you should always decide where you're searching. Are you searching in your document, all of the documents that are open, or I'm gonna hit done. Um, if you have something selected, you might be able to search just in the current text frame. I recommend always making sure you choose edit spelling, check spelling, and make sure you're checking your entire document. I don't want to choose all documents because I have other documents that are open and I'm not really interested in finalizing them just yet. When you're checking your spelling, by default, the spell check will automatically start and it will find the first error. And so you can see in this case, it's highlighted the word project and I have spelled it wrong. So it will give me a suggestion. I will double check it visually in my design and make sure I'm happy with the suggestion and choose change. If you come across a word that InDesign is flagging is not being correct, but you know that it is, like in the case that, as me describing an InDesign file as a .indd file, you can just hit skip, or if you know you've used it a lot throughout the design, you can hit ignore all. And you'll repeat that until you no longer have any errors in your document. If you would like to, you can also turn on dynamic spell check. That will allow you to see little red squiggly lines underneath your misspelled words so you can fix your typos on the fly. To do this, choose the edit menu, spelling, and instead of choosing check spelling, choose dynamic spelling. And then as soon as you do that, you can see that those InDesign INDD titles are flagged, but also a typo, I've, I've spelled important wrong. So I can look at that and say, oh, it should be IMP O-R-T-A-N-T, -T. and dynamically it will change. And I spelled receive wrong, right? I comes before E except after C, except for uh, in this example. Oh, actually it is, it's correct in this example. I comes before E except after C. And then as you're writing what you're writing or as you're editing your project, you can quickly fix your typos if you have any. Keyboard shortcuts and modifiers are another great form of basic automation that can be used in a variety of graphic art software applications to speed up the digital design process. A keyboard shortcut is applied when a key or multiple keys are pressed to activate an action. A keyboard modifier is used when a key or multiple keys are pressed in combination with a mouse click. Keyboard shortcuts and modifiers can vary from program to program and between Macs and PCs. In most cases, certain keys must be swapped when switching between Macs and PCs, but the keyboard shortcuts and modifiers will still work. For example, when I use the command and the option keys on my Mac, you would use the control and alt keys on your PC. Some of the key commands available for use in Adobe InDesign are shown on screen. I recommend writing them down, taking a screenshot, or printing the worksheet provided with this lesson. There are too many to memorize right now. Start by memorizing the ones you see as immediately useful for your purposes, and then challenge yourself to learn more as you go. Memorizing all of these keyboard shortcuts and modifiers is not a requirement of this class. However, from time to time, I may highlight certain keyboard shortcuts and modifiers and identify them as being essential. When I do this, you should write them down and work to memorize them. Let's take our automation techniques to the next level. In addition to basic techniques we've already discussed, InDesign users can use Find Change, Preflight Profiles and Auto Flowing Text, and Grep to increase design efficiency. We can also share swatches, styles, and parent pages with others so that they don't have to reinvent the wheel. In this demo, I am going to show you a few things that you can add to your repertoire uh, to increase your design efficiency and the speed at which you're able to perform your design processes. Let's get started by opening the Find Change dialog. And in InDesign, you can find that via the Edit menu and choose Find Change. You may be familiar with something similar in other software applications like Microsoft Word. 
You can use Find Change to search for text and replace words or phrases. So under the text option, which is default, if you search for a word, in this case, I don't know what I was thinking. Instead of writing pre-flight, I've been typing post-flight. So if I search for the word post-flight, I can say I want to change every instance of the word post-flight to be pre-flight. To perform this, I'm going to make sure my direction is forward and hit Find Next. InDesign will highlight the first instance of the word post-flight, and then I can type in here and make sure it's capitalized and say I want to change it to the word pre-flight and choose Change. And then I can repeat that, and I can keep working my way through the document until InDesign cannot find any more issues with my text. But the Find Change dialog is so much more powerful than that in InDesign. Instead of searching for words, I am going to erase the words and I'm going to search for attributes like colors or text settings and different things like that. On the bottom half of the text section, there's a find format and a change format, which works just like find what and change to, but it's for attributes. And so if you hit the little uh, magnifying glass on the right hand side, you can launch the find format settings dialog. And in here, because we're under the text settings, we're looking for text attributes to find, things that would apply to text. For this example, I am going to go to the indents and spacing section and choose left alignment. So I'm searching for anything that is left aligned. And then into the change format, I'm going to change that under indents and spacing to be right aligned. So if we start at the beginning of our document, we can hit Find Next, and instead of looking for words, InDesign is going to go through the document and it's going to try to find words that are left aligned. When it finds words, we can hit Change, and it will take those words and it will change it to whatever our change format is. In this case, it's going to make it right aligned. So if I had words that needed to change from left alignment to right alignment, I could continue hitting Find Next and I could change them in the document one at a time, or I could even find next and say, oh, that one's not supposed to be there. I'm gonna skip that one and just hit find next. But it doesn't stop there. The find change dialog also has grep settings, which we'll talk about later in this lesson, glyphs, objects, and color. And so you can search the document for different settings. Right now, I'm searching for color. In a previous iteration of this uh, textbook that I created, I used uh, a tint of black for the body copy, which I'm still using. So this is like, I don't know, 90% black instead of 100% black. And then when I created the headlines, I made them also 90% of the InDesign blue color. But when I exported the project and I ran it through an accessibility test so that I could use it inside my course, I was getting flagged because the blue, when it's at 90% tint, doesn't meet accessibility standards. So I had to go through my document and find every time I used 90% InDesign blue and change it to be 100%. To do that, I used the Find Change dialog. I went to Color, I chose the InDesign blue color, and I said, show me any InDesign Blue, you could really even do 0 to 90%, anything that's less than 90%. Or I could even do 0 to 99 because I want to make them all 100. And then I'll change it to that same color, but in this case, a 100% tint. Then when I hit Find Next, I went through my document one at a time and I updated all of those settings. I've already fixed it, so now I don't have any more issues. But that's a good example of how the Find Change dialog box can help you automate your design process. Because we know a lot about swatches. We know we could change a color swatch. But if I'm just using blue and I manually entered the tints as being 90%, I would have had to manually highlight each one, go to the swatches panel, change the tint from 90% to 100, and do that over and over and over again. Whereas the Find Change dialog can do it for me. The second thing that you can do to increase your design efficiency is to create custom pre-flight profiles. As we already know, pre-flighting is the process of making sure your project is uh, free from errors and ready to go to be given to someone else um, prior to packaging. We pre-flight using the pre-flight panel. You can open it via the window menu, output, and then pre-flight. 
The default setting has a profile of basic. And what basic does is it's going to test or it's going to run through your document and it's only going to look for missing or modified images or basic text errors. So you have overset text, you have fonts that are not installed, and those kind of things. And in the previous InDesign class, we've established that we have automated preflighting and we have manual preflighting. And automated preflighting is preflighting that will automatically appear for us on our preflight panel that we can then troubleshoot to fix. And then manual preflighting are things that we're going to do manually every time we preflight our project but you don't have to do them manually. If you open the preflight panel and hit the options flyout menu, you can define your preflight profiles. And you can see here that on the left, there's basic, which you cannot edit, digital publishing, which has specific settings that you might want for digital publishing. And then I created one called offset printing. You could create your own by hitting the plus sign and you can name it anything you want. So maybe you're always uh, preparing something for um, apps. And so you create a profile for apps. Once the profile is created, if you select it, you can look through all the settings under where it says general to see all the different things that you could change. So I'm going to collapse all of these so you can see the different categories. Under links, these are our pictures. So by default, it is going to tell us if the links are missing or modified or if we have um, a URL that is not accessible. Under color, you can, and you see I adjusted this for offset printing, you can say that I want you to tell me if color spaces are used. So if I'm preparing something for offset printing and I want every single color to be CMYK or spot color, I can say that RGB, gray, lab, and HSB colors are not allowed. So if I was to select OK right now, this profile would create a preflight error for every single instance that I've used a color that's not CMYK or spot color. If we look at the swatches panel, I have InDesign pink here in RGB. So if I was to hit OK right here, everywhere I've used this pink color, it would be flagged as an error that I need to fix. In addition, I know that I have used screenshots in this document that I have not converted to CMYK. So every single one of these screenshots is in RGB because I captured it off of a computer. And so if I switch my profile from basic to offset printing, anytime a color that's used that is not a spot color or not a CMYK color, I'm going to get an error. I have so many errors that it just says 100 plus. And just like our other automated preflighting errors, you can expand the errors to learn more about them. So every single error is based on color and every single error is using a color space that's not allowed. So it's using something that's not CMYK or a spot color. If you continue to expand, you can see every instance, you can click the little number of the page, it will take you to the frame and the bottom half of the panel will tell you that this fill color is RGB and what will happen or what needs to happen to fix it. And so you can create custom profiles to help speed up your, your manual preflight process so that you're not checking these things manually every single time you're preflighting and packaging your project. Next, I want to talk about sharing content to help others save time. When you're working in your InDesign file, as part of your good process, you're going to save your color swatches, you're going to create paragraph styles, and you're going to use parent pages. When you create these three things and you're working on a project across um, different departments or with other people, you may need to share them. We already know how to share swatches, so this should be a review. When you save swatches to your swatches panel, you can select the options flyout menu and you can choose to save your swatches. When you do this, it will create a .ase file. I'm gonna download them and I'm going to save them to my downloads folder for now. Whenever you have that .ase file in Adobe Swatch Exchange file, Someone else, so I will create a new document, and this new document will be the other person, can open up their InDesign document and on their swatches panel hit the option file out menu and choose to load swatches. When they find the .ase file that you provided, they can open it and then all of your swatches will be loaded. And so then they could delete all of these default swatches and now they only have the swatches they're allowed to use for the project.
The only hiccup to this is that you can't share gradient swatches or tint swatches, but you can share RGB, CMYK, process, spot, anything that's like a traditional color, but the gradients and the tints will not transfer when you save your .ase file. The next option is to share settings. So maybe you create a bunch of paragraph styles and I'm this is chapter three and I'm working on chapter three but someone else is working on chapter four and I don't want to write down all of the settings for the styles. An easy way to get styles from one document into another is to have both files. So I have the file for chapter three and I have the file for chapter four. You can share styles by having access to both files. They don't have to be open. This document can be closed, but you have to have access to the file. On the styles panel, whether that's the object, paragraph, character, table, or cell styles, you can hit the option flyout menu and choose to load paragraph styles. Find the InDesign file that has the styles. So mine is on the desktop and it's right here. When you select open, you will get a dialog prompt that says, here's a list of all of the styles that are in the document. Which ones do you want? So you probably don't want to bring basic paragraph because you don't use that. So if you want, you can bring all of the other ones. And when you hit OK, watch what happens to my styles panel. All the styles have automatically come over to InDesign. And when I go to apply them, I can quickly those are white, the text is white on those. I can quickly see what the settings are for all of the different styles that I have saved. And then I can use them and they'll be the same as the original document. The same applies to parent pages. In this document, I have a very basic parent page. I have an A parent and it just has a gray bar. And the, the thing I have on here is not that important, but you might end up with with a bunch of parent pages or you might end up with complex parent pages where you need to share the settings so that they are precise. You can share parent pages the same way that you share styles. Except for since it's a parent page you're going to go to the pages panel. You'll hit the option flyout menu, choose parent pages and then load parent pages. So again that's the options flyout menu on the pages panel, hit parent pages and then load parent pages. Again, find the document that has the parent pages and select open. You will get a prompt if the parent pages are duplicated. So in this case, um, chapter three is using a parent for the gray bar and untitled has a default a parent. If I know that it's the same and I want to keep the one that's in my document, I would hit, re I would hit rename. If I want to replace it, which is what I want to do, I can choose replace. But now, if I go to that parent page, I have copied it. Now this is a really good point to make, is your document size matters. So I'm on a parent and I have my gray bar and I've brought the content over, but you can see that I am working in a, in a portrait orientation document and my chapter three was landscape. So if you're gonna share um, styles across um, documents, it's not as big a deal what the document size is. But if you're going to share parent pages, it really does matter. So you might use it to bring the content over, and then you could kind of manipulate it for your page size. Or you'll want to make sure that your page size matches the page size of the document you're bringing the parent pages into. Uh, when we are formatting large bodies of text, two issues can occur. One, uh, we can have a lot of text that we need to format on many pages that we would want to automate that process for. And then sometimes when you bring text over from Gutenberg.org, depending on which format you copy, you're going to have a lot of hidden characters that you might want to get rid of. So I'm just going to uh, search and browse and grab a random book. Um, and I'm going to copy some text. So we'll grab The Girl with the Green Eyes by Clyde Fitch. There's lots of different options. I'm going to grab the plain text one for now because it's going to have those errors that I want to show you. And then I want to copy some of this content. So this is, I guess, is a play. This is act one. And it really doesn't matter how much I copy. I just want to get enough that it would be multiple pages. So if I don't see the end in sight anytime soon, I'm just going to stop copying right about here. When we go to InDesign, when you create your new document, file, new, and document, there is an option to have a primary text frame. 
When you create a document that has a top primary text frame, that text frame will automatically be set up as a text frame that will auto flow text. So if you were to add text to this, so I'm going to Command V or Control V to paste. If you wait a second, InDesign will recognize that there were not enough pages in the project. And then instead of having a one page document, I now have a 15 page document. If you forget to include a primary text frame, so your text is not going to auto flow by itself, you can activate auto flow in a number of ways. One option is to save your text as a word processing file and then place it. So I've created a new document. It does not have a primary text frame. And so if I was to choose file place, I could find wherever I saved all the text for my project. And then I would have a loaded cursor that would allow me to place it. If I hold shift, when I click to place, you will see that the cursor changes to a little squiggly line. Now, if I click to load, all of my pages will automatically be added for me. And so I will end up with a document. In this case, that's 12 pages. So something must be different about the formatting, the text, the typeface or something is different. But I have automatically generated those pages. The only downside of this is if you delete some of the text and you no longer need 12 pages, or in this case, 15 pages, InDesign won't automatically delete your pages for you. It will only automatically create your pages. You may notice that because it came from a source that wasn't formatting for your needs in InDesign, that the text looks a little funny. Always turn your hidden characters on. Go to the type menu and choose show hidden characters. In this case, you can see the text that I copied has lots of line breaks. It has these returns that I may or may not want. And if you ever want to get rid of them, so I'm going to make sure it's turned on in both documents, um, you can use the Find Change dialog that we learned earlier in this lesson. Go to the Edit menu and choose Find Change. The text, glyph, object, and color options are relatively straightforward, but the grep option is different. Grep stands for Global Regular Expression Print. Uh, it, it's saying, it's a phrase, so those are just the letters, but the phrase is, it's globally search for a regular expression and print. It dates back to computer programming and coding. When it says print, it's not, it doesn't mean to print on a printer. You're not getting a sheet of paper. It means to, to, to output or produce something. And so you can use grep to search for hidden characters. Text, we can search for text. Glyphs, we can search for glyphs. Objects, we can search for objects. And color, we can search for color. With glyphs, we're going to search for, for hidden things in the design that we want to change. So if I have multiple returns, as I can see here, I have three returns here, and maybe I just want two. On the find what, you can search for what you're, what you're looking for, hidden characters, and you can change it to something also hidden characters. So I can search for, hit the little at symbol. In this case, I can for, search for the end of a paragraph. When I do that, it shows me the grep coding to search for end of paragraph. It is backslash R. And I can change it to be nothing. Uh, so if I find next, I can say change it and it deletes it because it, it replaces it literally with nothing. If I know that I have three returns places, I could say search for return, 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 and replace it with just one return. So if I find next, it will highlight one, two, three returns. And when I change it, it will insert just one. So I could say anytime I have three, I just want it to be two. So I can put my cursor back at the beginning, find next, and then change. Then find next, it happened down here, change. Grep is difficult and it's confusing. And so I encourage you to explore kind of what is there. Like, here's a good example. If you're typing something and you have quotation marks and you want to change the style of the quotation mark and you want to change all of the measurements to be measurement quotations instead of typographer's quotations, you can search for your quotations and then you can replace it. So what I encourage you to do is to start by using these fields blank and then to find a setting and see what that setting is. So if I want to search for M space, 
the grep code for M space is tilde M. And so I'm looking for that and I can find it. It doesn't exist in my document, but you can start to see what the coding is for grep because you don't have to use this flyout menu. Once you know what the coding and the things mean, you can type in what you're looking for and then you can type in what you want to replace it with. This lesson only covered the tip of the iceberg when it comes to design automation and efficiency. I encourage you to continue exploring ways to speed up your design processes on your own. InDesign Secrets, which is now merged with Creative Pro, is an excellent resource for InDesign knowledge. Check them out at creativepro.com. They also have a YouTube account. You can find it by searching on YouTube for Creative Pro or InDesign Secrets. Oh, 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 oh,